Joining us is farmer, cook, and activist David Antonio Robles. David works at the intersection of culture, community, and food. He's a two-time recipient of our Future Organic Farmers Fund and a graduate of University of California Santa Cruz Caspis Farm and Garden. Today, David helps empower the next generation of youth and their relationship to a healthy lifestyle as the culinary and farm manager for Food What? And you're actually supposed to say it, Food What? And as you will soon hear, David has a rich history and knowledge of our agricultural history in the United States. So, David's gonna be sharing with us his grandmother's beloved enchiladas recipe and his own vision for a, a more just food system. So, welcome David, the kitchen's yours. Thank you for the intro. What's good, Joe? My name is David. Welcome once again to CCOF's annual keynote and conference. This is Cultivate and Nourish. Um, I appreciate the opportunity to give this keynote and share the mic with our previous speakers. This is my first ever keynote, Joe. It's wild. We got like three different cameras. We got special lights. We got mics in secret places. And this is me in my house. But for now, we're going to make this place home. And for the next few moments, we're going to cook up some food for thought. We are going to feed our hungry conscience. So. If you are receiving this invitation, it means that you are a part of the CCOF family and that you are somewhere along your food systems learning journey. So what that means is that every single one of us is involved in some aspect of food systems work. Now, the food system can be broken down in a couple different, couple different moving pieces. There's producing, so like growing and harvesting. There's distribution, there's processing and the ones that we probably participate in every day, consumption. Now, there's a couple of sub-layers to each of those, you know, like marketing and packaging and waste disposal, but for the most part, that's what it is. So, those are the big ones. Now, it was only in the past five years that I realized that food is not like other products that you just pull off the shelf and buy. And farming is not like other industries with a straightforward supply chain and straightforward demand. It's much more complex. It's global, it's political, and most importantly, it's personal. Now, this is where it's important to point out identities. The way that the world sees me isn't always the way that I see myself. So um, it's important that I point out that I identify as a Mexican American or a Chicano. I won't refer to myself as Latino because I can't really offer a cultural analysis for people from other countries in Central and South America. Um, and it's not really fair to lump us into one category like that. So I'm um, somewhere between like second, third generation Mexican, depending on how you look at it. I use he, him pronouns and also identify as a history nerd. Uh, I went to UCSC, got my history degree in history of the Americas. Tried to focus on social movements in the Americas that's where I got the opportunity to learn more about the history of West Coast agriculture. So, in, at, the same time, at the same time that I was going to school at UCSC, I was also working at the UCSC Farm and Garden. And that, it's also known as Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems. Now, those two things in tandem were probably the most important moments in my life, those years during the undergrad, because I realized that my existence here in this country was so deeply connected to the way our food system currently functions that I knew at that moment that this would be a lifelong pursuit, that this career choice had chosen me. So when I started to learn about farm policy and the global food system, one of the first things you learn about is corn production in the US, the industrialized production of corn. And it's often considered like one of the arch nemeses of our sustainable food movements. And y'all, it hurts my soul to know that growing corn in the U.S. can have such a negative connotation. Because corn, maize, is so sacred to our culture. I mean, our DNA is like literally made up of corn. It's been our main source of calories for years. So it breaks my heart to when I learned about corn production and NAFTA, the North American Free Trading Agreement. 
It's pretty well known nowadays that corn is massively overproduced in the U.S. because it's heavily subsidized. Now, what that leads to is exporting and the development of value-added goods that nobody asked for, things like high fructose corn syrup. Now, the point I want to make is this. Policies that were created in the U.S. and between other countries through, through agreements like NAFTA can be major contributors to immigration. Now, what happened, one of the major outcomes of NAFTA was that it flooded the Mexican corn market with cheap, Amer cheap American corn, subsidized corn. And rural Mexican farmers couldn't compete with those prices. And Mexico, as a result, saw the loss of 1.3 million farming jobs. Those are farming jobs, y'all. Recently, it has especially affected areas of Mexico, like the southeastern part of Mexico, um, the state of Oaxaca. And most of the Mexican immigrants nowadays are from those areas, which is somewhat of a shift from previous from previous decades where we saw most of Mexican immigration happening from states like Michoacan, Guanajuato, and uh, Jalisco. So it's no wonder that after the infiltration of genetically modified corn that, that relied on heavy chemical inputs like um, you know, synthetic fertilizers and herbicides, that Mexico saw environmental and economic devastation. So Mexican farmers are forced to look elsewhere for economic opportunity. They come to the U.S. to look for a job in which they can apply the agricultural expertise. And that's an important detail, y'all. Agricultural experts, that's who the American farm worker is. Now, whenever you look at an American farm worker, one thing that you should know, the thing that you should know, the thing that you should ask yourself is, is that an American farm worker or is that a displaced farmer? The people that we call farmer, farm workers are in fact land stewards. They carry with them generations and generations of agricultural knowledge that they bring to this country. And when you combine that with a work ethic and with an incredible work ethic and a desire to improve conditions for future generations, what do you get? You get fed. You get fed. So that was a big wake-up call for me because I realized that the U.S. profit-driven food system could have devastating effects on food systems in other parts of the world, like Michoacan, Mexico, where my family was from. So, oh, beautiful, Cut, chopping up some garlic right here. So farmers left Michoacan to work in the U.S. food system so as to not lose that ancestral connection in order to make sure that their future generations, their children, and their children's children would have access to those same opportunities. However, that wasn't my story because my family immigrated here before NAFTA. So while NAFTA is a major contributor to immigration today, it's not what drove immigrant. It's not what created the conditions that inspired my family to move here. So I'm still trying to answer the question, why am I here? So I had to go deeper. I had to go deeper. And it led me to learn more about the Bracero program. Now, the Bracero program was established in 1942 with the understanding that World War II would cause major labor shortages in ag. Now, that's how it was framed. But let's be clear, along the West Coast, the ag labor force was not white. 96% of US soldiers, on the other hand, were white. So our ag labor shortage wasn't being caused by farmers turned soldiers. It was being caused by Japanese internment. The majority of ag laborers here in the U.S. at that time were Filipino and Japanese immigrants. So Japanese internment was framed as a way to, excuse me, as a way to ensure the nation's security because Japanese Americans were considered a threat to the nation's security. However, 
Japanese, um, Japanese Americans were not being found to be Japanese spies that were hostile to the nation. And with that said, German Americans and Italian Americans were not also being incarcerated in mass. So what about the Japanese community was such a threat to this country? When we look at what the Japanese community was doing at that time, it might offer some clues. The Japanese American farming community was becoming incredibly successful in California. They were creating California's most productive farms. High labor, high yield techniques were making competing farmers envious. Two days after the attacks on Pearl Harbor, farmers, West Coast farmers like Austin Anson of the Salinas Grower Shipper Association began lobbying DC to begin the mass internment of Japanese people. These were farmers lobbying for Japanese internment, y'all. It's estimated that ja ja Japanese American communities lost around $112 million in revenue from agriculture. And most of that revenue went to competing farmers who had access to new land and new markets. Now, Japanese internment began in February of 1942. Six months later, the Bracero program was started to bring a new ag labor force into this country. So I was like, okay, there it is. That's why I'm here. Japanese internment, motivated by industry competition and racial resentment, created the conditions that required the U.S. to find a new ag labor force in Mexican Braceros. And that is why I'm here. So I was like, okay, I'm here. That's why. But once you start riding the history highway of our food system, y'all, you can't stop there. You have to keep going. So I went deeper. Who was here before Japanese farmers? The Filipino farming community was first recruited to work in the U.S. in American sugar plantations in the early 1900s. By the early 1930s, they were becoming well-established and well-organized. They began striking. And in 1933, Filipinos formed the first Filipino labor union. The very next year, the U.S. outlaws immigration from the Philippines by instilling a quota of only 50 Filipinos allowed per year. Now, this was just before, this was just before Japanese farmers rose to prominence. So those anti-Filipino immigration laws may have created the void that Japanese farmers then had to come and fill. So there's a pattern emerging, y'all. There's a pattern. First, Filipino workers were here. Then they were displaced by anti-immigration laws. Japanese folks came in to fill the void. Japanese folks were then placed in Japanese internment camps and the Mexican Bracero program started, and here I am. But we're gonna go deeper. Next stop, the, Jap the Chinese farming community. Y'all, Chinese people contributed countless innovations to American agriculture. I mean, they essentially transformed the Sacramento River Delta into one of the world's most productive agricultural regions. Chinese labor carried American agriculture from the late 1800s well into the 1900s before Filipino and Japanese farm workers got here. Now, again, it was no accident that Chinese people immigrated to the US and the timing is no coincidence either. In the decades leading up to the Civil War and those that followed, American plantation owners sought to replace African slave labor with Chinese immigrants because it's easier to control a community of immigrants. And Chinese immigrants in particular could be controlled at this time through indentured servitude. So as the Chinese population grew in the US and they learned how to navigate this society and gain their own liberation and learn how to gain success and establish their own communities and set roots, it spurred a wave of anti-Chinese sentiment that would ultimately result in the Chinese Exclusion Act. And this would create a void of agricultural expertise once again. Since we're working backwards, we know that Chinese labor was then replaced by Filipino farm workers, then Japanese farmers, then Mexican braceros. But this right ain't over, yo. We gotta talk about what happened before Chinese people were prompted to immigrate to the US and what prompted them. Just like other immigrant communities in the US, Chinese farmers were brought here to fill a void of agricultural skills and knowledge. 
Following the Civil War and the emancipation of African American slaves, Southern plantation owners were not willing to break from the free labor model that slavery had allowed them. However, it wasn't just reliant on free labor. It was reliant on agricultural expertise. Historians have found that during the early years of colonial slavery, certain regions of Africa were targeted. The western coast of Africa was known to have thriving agricultural communities that specialized in rice cultivation. Now, that's an important detail because that rice cultivation relied on complex irrigation methods that meant that these African farmers knew how to grow a variety of crops in a variety of different geographical climates. Now, that knowledge, those, that knowledge of irrigation methods meant that Europeans could rely not only on forced labor, but on their agricultural expertise. After all, Europeans imagined that they would have to build an agricultural economy from the ground up, assuming that there wasn't an agricultural economy already in place. Now, time out, time out. Let's chew on that one for a second. Europeans imagined that they would have to build an agricultural economy from the ground up. Now, are we implying that there was no agricultural community already in place? That there was no agricultural community already there? No, never. Of course there was an agricultural economy already in place, y'all. And that is where I found the root to the answer to the question, why am I here? Native Americans, people indigenous to these lands, have been and always will be the authority on how best to engage agricultural practices in this country. There it is. That is because, that is because that relationship is thousands of years old. And that relationship is not just a style of agriculture that produces food. It is a way to organize entire societies. They teach us that food is a form of communication between us and our environment. They teach us that food reflects the health of our environment by reflecting that health onto our physical and spiritual bodies. Food, they teach us, is a form of communication between our ancestors and our children because food is a timeless form of love and affection that can never be forgotten. Native Americans and any group of indigenous people that has spent a millennia cultivating a relationship to land have evolved to understand that our food systems should always be the cornerstone of our cultures. When we cultivate healthy food systems, we are cultivating a culture of love and connection with each other and with the planet. And you know what, y'all? You know what? That connection was nearly severed. We nearly lost that connection when Native Americans suffered genocide and land theft at the hands of European colonizers. That moment in history was a step backwards for the evolution of our species because we lost so much knowledge of how to be in the world. We lost that almost, almost, almost. And you know what? We have been struggling ever since to get it back. And that, my friends, is why I am here. We have attempted to fill the void left behind by indigenous knowledge in all the worst ways. First, we bring African slaves to the US to bring that agricultural expertise to the US. Then once African slaves are emancipated, we replace them with indentured Chinese servants. After the Chinese Exclusion Act, 
we replace them with Filipino farm workers. After they get excluded with anti-Filipino immigration laws, we bring in J Japanese people to come and work in our agricultural industry. And then after we displace them, we replace them with Mexican braceros. And now here we are. Here I am being tasked with fixing this broken food system. Here I am being told to feed a nation with a food system culture that extracts profits from our bodies and our ancient wisdom only to turn around and attack our communities from multiple different angles. And y'all, I, I used to get really overwhelmed by this. I used to hold so much stress and pressure in my body. And I didn't, I didn't, I didn't know how, I didn't know what to do. You know, I didn't know what the next step was. I, in order to exist here in this country, in order to be valued as a full human being with a whole culture, I needed to figure out a way to dismantle an oppressive colonizer food system. And what does that even mean? What does that even look like? What is, what, I mean, what would it look like to be successful? How would I know if I was successful? What do we gain? What do we lose? Is it a waste of my time? Do we have enough time? I didn't know the answers to these questions. And as a coping mechanism, I would just load up my to-do list with way too many things in the hopes that with enough labor, I would produce a solution. I would produce some form of liberation. And then some really important things happened in 2020. I learned to redefine my productivity. I learned that when I rest, I produce energy to do more and to do better. When I laugh, I laugh in the face of those who, I laugh in the face of crisis and I laugh in the face of those who don't care whether or not we live or die. And in fact, even set up the barriers that lead to our death. I learned to abandon misery resistance, as Adrian Marie Brown calls it, and instead embrace love as my sole form of motivation. I'm not working against anyone anymore. I'm working for my loved ones. But the next thing that I learned was probably the most pivotal, was probably the most important, because the mutual aid networks that popped up across the country were some of the most revolutionary things I have ever seen. I mean, it was like ordinary people, with not that much extra, just a little bit, were pulling together resources, communicating with each other quick, getting them to exactly where they needed to go, boom, boom, boom. In any crisis, when we had COVID, Black Lives Matter, the wildfires, wherever that need was, it shifted to exactly where it needed to be. And to be honest, it made oppressive government policies and practices look obsolete. It made an oppressive government look obsolete. And I needed to see that. I needed to see that what we needed wasn't charity, it was solidarity. I needed to see that because it taught me that instead of focusing on fighting an oppressive system, I needed to turn inwards and begin building our own support systems. In that case, I needed to reorient myself to food systems work. I don't want to battle. I want to build. I don't want to fight. I want to feast with my family. I don't want to try and remodel cultures and systems that were never ours to begin with. I want to take a deeper look at my culture and see what we need to build. Woo. Now we're cooking, y'all. Now we're cooking. Mm. I want to work with my people to cultivate our culture. And I hope that doesn't come off as I'm turning my back on people of other cultures. I would invite y'all to do the same exact thing. What would it look like? What would it look like? If y'all did the same thing I did, answer that question, why am I here? Why am I here? 
particularly those of European descent who came to this country because my history highway trip, it ended right there at European colonization. I don't know why Europeans came over here. What was their motivation? What were the conditions that caused this? Seriously, if you go through that process like I did, you might find something really important about your culture and how that culture has affected other people. Now, some of this work is about the individual. It's personal, right? So if I can offer a tool, if I can offer a tool, I suggest using food systems work as a way to take a, deep, a, a deeper dive into your own culture, to do some reflecting in that way. Through food systems work, I keep finding ways to celebrate elements of my culture that I love and challenge elements of my culture that are toxic. Y'all, I'm doing it right now. Look at this. Look at this. To see a young Chicano, a young brown man with his apron cooking up, kit, cooking up Mexican food in the kitchen for his Mexican family, that is a rare thing. That is a rare thing. It's cultural and not in a good way. Not in a good way. There's an element of Mexican culture that we call machismo. Machismo. And in this context, the closest thing I could compare it to is like toxic masculinity, right? For example, when Mexican men refuse to do anything domestic in the house, like cook or clean or take care of the kids, that's machismo. And in terms of cooking, barbecuing doesn't count unless you're willing to let other genders have a swing at the barbecue pit too. You see what I'm saying? It's machismo to genderize certain types of cooking and it has to stop. Now, my dad modeled this for me when I was young, but it wasn't always like that. It wasn't always like that. My mom had to call it out. I remember days, or it was like, these were like weekends where my mom would come home so exhausted and fed up with holding all the responsibilities of a Chicana woman with big time career aspirations and all the domestic responsibilities of a woman in a house with four boys that she would just shut down the house. She would shut it down. Nobody in that house was going to have a good day until they listened to what mom had to say. And look, cooking was one thing, but it's huge. It's, it takes work. And the modern Mexican-American man can't expect a woman to serve him in that way. So props to Pops for making the change, but my mom was the one who called it out and my dad eventually answered the call. It's a way of supporting your partner by sharing domestic responsibilities, and it's an essential element that all genders should participate in if they want healthy family dynamics. And it's important. It's so important for us to take that critical look at our own cultures and examine what it is that we want to hold as tradition. Because if we need to break them, that is essential for us as a people. It's important that we look at the historical side of it, too, where some of these things might stem from, right? Look, I love agua de tamarindo. It's an agua fresca that, that is like one of my favorites. However, it would be wrong for me to claim that type of agua fresca as solely Mexican, as a Mexican thing, because tamarind fruit isn't even from Mexico. It's from Africa. It's from Africa, y'all. Many of our foods have deep cultural roots with Africa because Mexico has a long history with Africans too. Initially brought here as an enslaved community by Spaniards, African people fought right alongside us in the war for independence. They helped us gain independence from Spain. Whew. And that's beautiful. That is beautiful. But despite this, despite this, African people in Mexico face the same state-sanctioned racial violence that America inflicted on their African-American communities. And it left a racist stain on Mexican culture that we pretend doesn't exist. And it does. It does. We have work to do on that front because we still see racism in our communities today, generally in the form of colorism. The obsession with having 
lighter skin and not being dark skinned is stems from the actual legal status that you could attain if the light the light of your skin was this was the caste system that was in place in mexico for years we see this type of discrimination in the fields today in our food system today when dark-skinned mexicans from areas of mexico that have deeper indigenous and african roots are relegated to the worst paying toughest jobs in the field and they're rarely given the economic opportunity to move up often undercut by our own people by other mexicans who feel this sense of superiority and if we want to address that racism we have to start by elevating african history as mexican history too and one way we can do that is to acknowledge when we cook african influenced foods like rice or agua de jamaica or agua de tamarín when we acknowledge them we acknowledge that that is our history too and that they are a part of who we are so when we when we have developed like those types of particular dishes we are acknowledging that we have done that thanks to the culinary and agricultural expertise of african people cool so the first cooking experience what that I ever had was sort of a situation where I was called to nourish my community. It was as an apprentice at the Center for Agroecology and Sustainable Food Systems. You'll hear me refer to it as farm school. Now, at farm school, when you cook, two people take the whole day off from cooking to, uh, to cook three meals for 40 people. That was my first cooking experience. And Keep in mind, y'all, I was in a cohort of like food all-stars. Shout out to the cohort of 2017. I was in a cohort of food all-stars. I mean, these are people that came from like all over the world to learn about food systems. And these are people that were so passionate about food that it inspired me to overcome my anxiety of cooking. Now, why did I have anxiety about cooking? Because I had never cooked. To be honest, y'all, I didn't even know where to start. I didn't know where to start. And all I knew was that I wanted people who ate my food to know that I loved them, that I loved them, because that's how I feel when people cook for me. And you know what? Nobody does that better than grandmas do. So I, I thought about one of my favorite foods as a kid and uh, took me back to my grandma Yoli's Avena. Now, if you've eaten on one of the cooking days at farm school, on one of my cooking days, you've had Grandma Yoli's Avena. So let's give a shout out to her. Thank her for that, for that recipe. But when she was teaching me how to make it, y'all, it was crazy. It was, like, it was like a time machine. All of a sudden, I was seven years old again, trying to peer up at the stove, watching her stir it, just anxiously waiting until I can eat like four bowls of it. And that was such an important experience for me because I realized that food was giving me the opportunity to connect with the elder generations of my family. I realized that in doing that, we were cultivating our culture. Our elders are often the keepers of that ancestral knowledge. And when they leave this life, they don't really go. They don't really go. We immortalize them in the food that we cook because those recipes are acts of affection that we can pass on to our children and younger relatives. So cooking your ancestors' recipes is a cultural practice that can drastically change the way we interact with the food system. Now, as farmers, we always need to consider what the dietary needs are of our communities, and it isn't limited to just ancestral foods. You gotta think about nutrition too, right? That's because people from different regions of the world have evolved to eat different foods. Our digestive system reflects the foods that grew well in the climates that we are indigenous to. There's, there's been a bunch of studies about this, and you can read about them in this amazing book called Decolonize Your Diet by Luz Calvo and Catrón Arrueda Esquivel. Now, the book highlights the health disparities, the drastic shifts in health for immigrants in the US upon arriving to the US. Now, that shift 
is known as the Latinx immigrant paradox. That refers to the phenomenon where first generation immigrants are actually healthier than their children, than second or third immigration or second and third generation immigrants. Now, di things like diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease, and certain types of cancer are so prevalent now in our communities. And y'all, I have experienced this firsthand. I don't put this on, but I'm not gonna dance to this because this isn't a good thing that I'm about to talk about. My mom got colon cancer at the age of 40. Y'all, that is not normal. That is not normal. Women don't even get colonoscopies until they're 60. Men when they're 50. Now she survived and she, she fought it and won because she's a Wonder Woman type superhero. But I mean, we were, we didn't really know why. You know, we, she wasn't a smoker. She was like pretty healthy. She was physically active. And it's really hard to, to pinpoint one thing as, as the cause for a person's cancer. But we know that colon cancer is a digestive system cancer. It's a digestive system cancer. And American food culture isn't exactly known for being the healthiest. When people come here and, in, and indulge in, in American, the worst parts of American health culture, those are often diets high in sugar, preservatives, oils, and heavily processed foods that are very different from traditional Mexican foods. Traditional Mexican foods are often high in nutrients like fiber, which is an essential nutrient for regulating digestive system health in your organs like your colon. And Mexican food is more than just red meat. This is why I love enchiladas, because we got like five, six different vegetables that we're cooking with right here. So when I cook Mexican food and try to make it healthy, what that means is that I'm trying to cook with foods that are culturally relevant. Cooking with culturally relevant foods isn't just a way for us to connect with the land and our ancestors. It's actually a way for us to be in good health, to be in good health. Farmers, land stewards, let's take note of that. Let's take note of that. Now, I wanna talk about my grandparents for a little bit because they were the land stewards. They were the land stewards. Now, I grew up in a town called Arroyo Grande uh, it's in San Luis Obispo County. Shout out to the 805. And right across the street from my high school, we were surrounded by ag land, literally surrounded by it. There was a couple of acres of conventionally grown veggie crops. And my grandpa worked there. He worked right across the street from my high school. And I remember that on, the, that, on that farm, high schoolers weren't allowed to walk on it because they didn't want people walking when they had just sprayed, right? They didn't want people being exposed to the dangerous chemicals. And so we weren't allowed to walk there, which sucked because it was like the perfect shortcut to get home. But that's how it was. My grandma worked just down the street from the high school in some greenhouses. She would do like uh, plant breeding, you know, like hand pollinating, creating different breeds of plants and stuff like that. Now, I didn't realize this till later, but it turns out that my grandma was actually working for Monsanto, which makes sense thinking back to it as a kid, because there would be the occasional protester outside, like trying to block the entrance. But anyways, after years of migrant farm workers, uh, after years of migrant farm work, my grandparents, you know, bouncing up and down the states, they settled down on the central coast. My grandpa started working at a conventional veggie farm. My grandma worked for Monsanto. Now, this was another really important opportunity that I had to look, to take a deeper look at my culture. When you come to the US as an immigrant, like my grandparents did, you do so with the hopes that your children will have more opportunities and that they will be successful. It's never about you, it's always about the next generation. And we can dance to that. Mm. So, usually, 
that for younger generations, that means making more money. But I was never really about that get rich thing. I was never really about that. So for me, what that meant was that if I was going to take what the opportunities that they fought to provide me with, if I was going to take that to the next level, what I needed to do was not just work at a, at a farm. I was going to run my own farm and it was going to be organic and people could walk on that farm and there would never be protesters outside trying to block the entrance because everybody loved us and our seeds were open source and uh and that was an upgrade that's that was us taking it that would be me taking it further going going beyond that i have always felt sort of a responsibility to take those opportunities that my grandparents and my parents fought to provide me with and take off go take flight go further be greater because your success isn't just your success, it's your family's success too. And that concept of family success is something that I think we need to apply to our food system in deeper ways. And I'm not talking about the individual success of family farms, that's not what I mean. I would encourage farmers to approach food systems work with the understanding that we live in one house and that we share limited resources, usually things like land, water, and markets, and that in order to ensure that the next generations would be successful, that we needed to be communicating with each other. We needed to work in collaboration. We need to take a more collective approach to our food systems work. A house is run by a family, not by one family member. And if only one family member is eating, but nobody else in that family, in that house is eating, that's not success. So we need to take that collective approach. And that's really hard to do if we're not in conversation with each other. That's why I'm really excited to see the growth of organizing platforms like the National Young Farmers Coalition, because they're providing us with the tools and resources to collectivize our political voice, you know, things like our political voice, and advocate for policy that helps us sculpt a better food system. That's super important. CCOF right now is currently leading a campaign to increase government funding for organic certification. Y'all, organic certification can be, that cost can be a backbreaker for small to mid-sized farms. So check out the chat box in order to uh, see an easy way to advocate for saving that organic cost share program. Now, policy participation is so important for us to, to engage that collective approach with because that cost, that cost, the cost of things like organic certification and policies that make it hard for us to make our farms economically viable can be addressed through policy, right? So, in order to have those conversations, we need to come together. That can be tough. It can be tough to, to agree on the same guidelines. And we can't blame consumers for all the problems in the food system. Consumers live within a food system with multiple players. So that's where policy participation can come in handy. Now, having those conversations is tough, but we can follow the lead of those who want in this order, a food system that is environmentally sustainable, socially just, culturally relevant, and economically viable. Agriculture is the lifeline that connects us to the planet. And if we aren't taking a collective approach to that work, we'll lose that connection. So it's time we learn how to have those conversations. Um, Let's, let's start wrapping things up, y'all. The, the enchiladas are done. I don't want those to get cold. And these are pretty much done right here. So let's, let's bring it back. Let's wrap it up. This whole time, I've been talking about how a career in food systems has helped me take a deeper look at my culture. And that food system history avenue allowed me to find the right historical perspective to help me understand what it is I need to do. The reason why I am here has 
been influenced by the history of this food system. And that's why I had to turn inward. That's why I had to take a deeper look, focus on changes that need to be made in my culture before I try pressing on visions, my vision for the food system onto other people. I need to take a deeper look at what my culture's needs are because our approach to food systems work will vary depending on our histories and our intentions and what it is we've experienced in the food system already. So food systems work is giving me new tools to be able to look at some of like the toxic elements of Mexican American culture and challenge those. At the same time, Mexican, the, the pieces of Mexican American culture that I'm proud of, things like strong family dynamics, are proven to be a potentially useful model for how we can sculpt a better food system, right? That work that, hap that had to happen for me as an individual, and that had to be something that I did with my people, that I'm doing with my people. When we, when we take that approach, we make it personal. And that work, that hard work, that hard day-to-day, -day, like eight o'clock to eight o'clock work day becomes suddenly way more manageable. It becomes sustainable when it's personal, when it's coming from love, when it's about who you are as a person and as a culture. That's why I'm so blessed to be working with food what? To be working with young people, y'all. These young folks, they, they are so intuitive. They hold so much knowledge and experience because they carry with them the experience of all the previous generations before them. So from them, I actually learn. I actually learn so much about how they experience the food system, how they experience how their cultures have been affected by this food system. And a lot of them share the same identities as me, but some of them don't. And it's cool to learn, to learn about that and learn how they have experienced this food system. Every day I have that opportunity to learn from those future generations and how they experience food, how they experience food culture. When we do that, when we do that, we are taking a deeper look at this food system's work. We're not just chugging along, planting and growing and eating. When we do that, we are thinking about how best to make this food system healthy and have it serve people and the planet. As we like to say at Food What, this work has to be grounded in love and rooted in justice. We grow food that grows us. We are growing the food of our ancestors and we are doing it with a love for the lands that was passed down to us through that ancient knowledge. We're cooking the food together. We're cooking the food together. That is collaborating on projects. And we're eating the food together. That act in and of itself is an act of affection. It's an affectionate conversation. And when we invite people to the table to have these conversations, we cultivate our culture. We are actively cultivating our culture and we're nourishing our people. Once I feel, once I feel that I have the love and support of my people, I'll look outwards again. I'll start engaging other systems and people of other cultures to focus more on how we can come together and have those conversations. But for now, me and my people got some work to do. I have some more learning and unlearning to do. But in time, in time, we'll come together as a greater community. We'll come together as a family. So there it is, fam. Cooked up some food for thought. We got some enchiladas placeras right here. I hope that 
Y'all aren't too stuffed. I hope that this was a little bit of what your hungry souls needed. Thanks again for joining us this year for the annual keynote and conference. Um, if you want to follow up about something or you want to contact us, reach out. Um, my contact info is there on the CCOF webpage. If you want to learn how to make enchiladas placeras, uh, you can check out the CCOF recipe that my grandma and I put together. We put together a little cooking demo so that you can learn how to make this. And I just want to thank you all for the work that you have done and the work that you will do. We're all along this food systems learning journey. And I appreciate you all being open to the new things that we might find along that journey. So. Thanks again, y'all. This was CCOF's annual keynote and conference, Cultivate and Nourish. Thanks, y'all. Appreciate it. Wow, it smells absolutely delicious in here. Thank you so much for dropping your wisdom and your knowledge on us, for cultivating and nourishing our minds, our hearts, and our souls. I hope to see you all very soon. Thanks for joining us. Until then, take good care of yourselves. Make yourselves some homemade enchiladas. You won't regret it. I can't wait to try some myself. Follow us on Instagram and check out our CCF blog for more stories about farmers fighting for a more just food system. Okay, take care. Bye for now. Mm -hmm.